Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Jonna Hudson and I will be hosting the Nest Egg Builder. Uh, Peggy is on the road this week. This week we have a Community Investing back to talk about uh, what they've been working on. And before we we before I introduce them, I'd like to share a quote by Warren Buffett. It said, "The tragedy of passive investing is that it's straight." It's a strategy that's long in evidence and short on influencers. And he's talking about how the cryptocurrency had all of these mega stars, but no one's out there promoting strategies that actually work. And, um, you know, with the, and you get the nest egg builder trying to move that, but we're nowhere near the kind of hype that, that crypto gets. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's a tried and true love um multifamily i think is an anchor in that right now and we will have community investing let me get the bio up joining us today is chris smelzer chris started his career with ford motor credit company for over a decade as a sales and in, in financial manager he has operated at the highest levels in the real estate mortgage and financial industries Chris is an active licensed mortgage loan originator and has almost 25 years of business and finance experience. David is a relationship centric leader focused on implementing the community investment groups growth strategies. He originated investment opportunity. He originates investment opportunities, cultivates investor relationships and asset manages deals he procures. David has over 25 years of experience in growing businesses. He has assisted in the property and equity acquisitions of thousands of apartments in the mid mid east. Together, they are taking a holistic approach to multifamily investing, truly bettering the lives of their residents and transforming the communities they serve. And if let me spotlight you and if you will introduce Brett for us, that would be great. How you doing? I'm Brett Rosemeyer. I'm the youngest but tallest of the group here. <laughs> but uh, I started uh, my career as actually a professional volleyball player and uh, moved into uh, commercial roofing sales. And that's how I got introduced um, to Community Investment Group. I was doing some, um, you know, work on one of their roofs um, and started talking with Dave about the acquisition side and um, Love the business and started uh, on with the community investment group about a year and a half ago. So uh, that is my background and um, love this team, love this organization, and uh, we're, we're doing good things. So we're excited to share with you guys. Yeah, Brett's been doing a great job. So I'm Chris. Nice to see everybody again. And of course, this is David next to us. And Brett's joined our team, like he said, uh, just under two years ago, and he's done great. He's been the best analyst we could possibly ask for. So we appreciate everything you do. And good to see everybody again. We've had a chance to talk to the Nest Egg group before, uh, David and I, and so we're happy for all three of us to be here and uh, see everybody again. I don't know if you have. Would you all like right. for us? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, why don't you start with um, a little bit of an intro on what you guys do for those that, that didn't see the previous um, time you were on, and then give us a little bit of status of where you are since then. Yeah, so I guess I can start with what we've done and, and what we spoke about you guys before. So we are uh, based out of Chesapeake, Virginia Beach area of Virginia. Uh, we are a multifamily apartment uh, company. Um, we're just over 130 employees, so a little bit, a little bit more. We've grown since uh, we've seen you guys last. Um, we own and operate all of our own company um, uh, projects and apartments. We have just over 4,000 apartments right now. Um, and growing. We went through our goals with you guys last time. Uh, we've hit all of those goals. I think last time before we spoke, we were just closing about a thousand apartments. So we've gone from about three to four um, with our goal to hit almost five by the end of this year um, and then grow from there. So we're in the Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and now Florida area, which we've grown into this year. Um, yeah. And so we've had uh, obviously some fantastic uh, results. I'll turn it over to Dave um, if you want to kind of update them on some of our more recent stuff that we've down here? Yeah. Um, so we just just completed a six six property uh, refinance. We purchased that uh, 20 months ago. And the uh, the per performa, three-year performa that we had, um, we were able to exceed that um, in the 20 months. And just um, it was a 
the properties were were ter in a tertiary market. Um, lots of, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know, interest rates went through the roof. Insurance uh, went up. Um, all the things that affect multifamily, and we're able to, you know, perform even faster than our our performa uh, during that time period. And so that was a um, 274 unit uh, spread out among six properties. And that one we purchased for 16.1 million. Um, we just did a cash out refinance uh, for a price for 36 million. And we were able to return our investors 20% um, average annual return. Um, and that's that completed our, that was um, our ninth, uh, ninth property uh, that we had done uh, full full turn on and uh, return that great investment. Yeah, the exciting thing I think for me is kind of coming in. I think it was less than a year ago that we met everybody last time, but you know we were talking about our three previous full turns because we have thirty five current properties that are all in different cycles, which will all for full turn as we go through them. Uh, you know, but we had our our major full turn, which was our first one, Autumn Lakes, which we had purchased for thirteen point seven million. Um, after uh, two years of working on that and doing our um, uh, value infusement that we do, that had um, uh, refinanced for fifty-six million was the valuation at that, and you know we've kind of been told at that time that's kind of a unicorn. It's not really a thing that you can do. But as we'll get into today, and like we've touched touched on before, um, is it really is our system and what we've mastered and perfected, and we get better at every day. But we do multifamily different than anyone we've met. You know, Peggy isn't on this um, this podcast. We've gotten to know her for a long time, and she has dozens of years of experience in this. And one of the things that we really connected with her on is that she meets with owner operators um, or really sponsors, what they call them. And, and she has even self-admitted that she really hasn't seen a structure like ours. We do it a lot differently, which I think Dave and uh, Brett will touch on. Uh, but that one unicorn that we had, which will never happen again, we've just continued to do it over and over and over in nine full turns. Right now we have seven projects that are really ready. We're just testing the market for them to go, but they're they're stabilized. They've done these exact same results that they'll refinance, of course, over the next three to six months. And um, and again, that just continues to uh, the investors that come on board, the different sponsors and uh, partners that come on board. We continue to have these results. And I think we're excited to tell people how we're doing it and why we think the way we're doing it. Um, as a forever owned group is a different way of thinking, but as you can see, it's a financially better way of doing it. And what Dave really will probably get into is how much better it is for the community. There, there's a right way to do multifamily apartments. There's a wrong way. There's the way that everybody else does it. And I think what we found is the way to be the most profitable to everybody involved, but also the best for the community involved. So I think and then, maybe, yeah. That's kind of how we decided what we were going to talk about here today too, is that we you know, we love talking about our success and, you know, in the multifamily space, there's many different things you can talk about that people are doing similarly. And, um, you know, there's a specific structure that most people are doing it at, but we do things a lot differently. And that main thing that we thought we should talk about is the forever hold model. Uh, we, um, our founder, uh, when he was first starting was flipping houses. Um, and, you know, a lot of people have great success doing that, but, Thing about flipping houses is once you sell them and you come back you know six months a year later you know the grass might be up to here because no one's taking care of it anymore and you put you, your blood sweat and tears into this property and now you know it just is not the same level or, or sustained that you want it to be because you flipped it and sold it to someone else so we put that model into multifamily and really try and transform these communities and we buy a lot of uh, low-income housing communities or just NOAA, like a, affordable housing um, that people just forget about or buy them and flip them a couple of years later. And these communities really aren't transforming the way that we want to see them grow. Um, you know, a lot of these low-income communities, um, people just don't put the CapEx money into them that, they're, that are needed to provide this is the basic needs of some of these residents. Um, I mean, things like they people tell us to close down the basketball hoops or the, um, or take them down and to close the pools and all different kinds of things that really do bring people in as a community, just because they think crime may happen in those areas or it's too much work to sustain them. So um, we take a very different mindset to it that we want to own this forever. We want the people to stay that are moving in 
be, because they actually want to, not just because it's the cheapest place to live in the area. And so we, you know, you know, put more money into these properties with, you know, the goal of a financial return, obviously at the end, but also to to see these residents, you know, really enjoy the community that they're in and transforming not just where they're living, but their lives at the same time. Yeah, I think what we found is that the natural cycle of what most people do with almost every apartment community that you drive by is most owners own these for about a three to five year cycle. They come in heavy up front. They have some capital. They have some ideas. They'll do some great things. And then it changes hands in three to five years because everyone buys them and they sell them. And they buy them and they sell them. And at some point, they have less and less capital, less and less interest. That A property turns into a B, turns into a C. And then eventually it's just forgotten. And that's how you end up with a lot of these communities that are half empty, uh, leading to this you know affordable housing gap that we have in this country. And so we think we found a way where we can own these properties, put just as much, if not more, capital than people put into them up front get those same great returns that everyone else has that turns them over in three to five years, but we're going to keep them and we're going to make sure that community continues to thrive as it goes. Cause we're going to go heavy up front um, with the actual quality of terms of these units in terms of these communities. That's a much better place. So. Yeah. And that, that creates a unique investment structure um, similar to, or the same as the sixth prop that we just finished in that when you're a forever hold, the typical model is that you would sell the property and whatever ownership you had as an investor, money would just get divided up and you'd have a, a certain waterfall payout. But when you're you're owning forever, um, it's it's a very front end loaded return for the investor uh, because we're we're in it for the long haul. And so, you know, we've got 130 people uh, that we, you know, Full full time employees that were put in to work on on these opportunities, and the way that the the cash flows is that at a refinance, the senior mortgage gets paid off, um, like in all in all deals. But but secondly, the investor all of their capital gets paid back next, which is is very unique, and so. As soon as you get above just paying off the loan, then you know the investor is next, and it's not a broken up where you know you own ten percent, so you get ten percent of the cash. The investor gets all of the cash until they're completely, you know, investment return goes back, and then on top of that, you get twenty percent, um, and then it's you know, and then it's divided out. Um, so that's it's very unique. Um, and, you know, it really insulates your investment as well as when we're refinancing. A lot of you know that, you know, the bank is only going to give you about 70 percent uh, loan to value uh, maximum. So on top of that refi and that payout and that great return, there's an additional 30 percent of equity that's still just sitting there in the property. So there's there's so much you know, equity and insulation in, in that investment. Um, and that's, that's very unique. I don't know of anybody else that has that structure where, where all of the investor capital is returned before the person actually putting in the sweat and the tears and the paying all the payroll gets anything. Uh, so that's, so we have that really strong, very unique investment structure. Do you want to tell them, cause you're the expert of that, how do you take a property from 16.1 to $36 million in 22 months? Yeah. That's probably really important because it's what we've done on all of our properties. And so yeah. it's probably important to tell them that. Yeah, it's it's a great question. And you know, to be honest, it's it's not easy. Um, these are we we have a, a niche that we really enjoy purchasing um in, and it's you know, it's not in your your major markets, it's not Miami, it's not Houston. These are smaller towns, you know, where it's just, it's the nicest asset in the area. There's not a brand new Amazon or a Google headquarters built next door. It's just a nice place to live. And in some cases, it's the only nice place in the town to live. And so the demand is great. Um, and it's, you know, they're, they're newer built properties. Um, so you don't have all the problems you have of your... Sorry about that. 
um, of your older um, older builds with you know plumbing and electrical issues, and we're able to buy it at great great basis. Being um, they call them LIHTC low income housing tax credit properties. So the the original builder um, of the property they're they're given a tax credit to go in there and build these affordable housing and make it affordable rents. Um, and then that lasts for 15 years. After that, you go into what's called extended use. And that's where we like to, to purchase. So we're typically, you know, 2000, uh, 2006 built properties. And the, uh, the original builder um, had those tax credits. So they're able to um, sell it for, for a great deal. And we have restrictions on the amount of rent that we can charge on these, but because of uh, inflation and COVID and lots of different things, the uh, the rent that we're able to achieve because, you know, everybody's getting paid more than they ever did and the area of median incomes is great. Um, there's a opportunity in there to charge, you know, a reasonable amount, uh, but something that works really well for us. Um, pay a, a great basis. The uh, six prop was, I think, 50, 51 a door. Yeah, 50. Um, average between the 274 units of 51,000 a door. So that's kind of our our starting point is, you know, can you build a unit like this today for 51,000 a unit? No, you can't. Um, so if it's, you know, half the price of the cost of, of building it, you know, that's a great start. And then we go in and we do all of these amazing things in the community. And it's not just your regular amenities. Um, yes, we do the playgrounds and the basketball courts and the, you know, fix the pools all up. Um, but it's a lot more than that. Um, we move, uh, we partner with Apartment Life. Um, that's a, um, they act as kind of like a RA for, for college where it's usually, a lot of time it's a couple and, um, they'll move into one of the apartment units and, you know, every new resident that moves in, they, they meet them um, and they introduce them to the community. And then they host a couple events um, every month and they give us feedback on, you know, if there's needs in that community and they really form that sense of community with everybody where it gets people out, they get to know each other. Um, there are benefits of, you know, that being a, they become a little more sticky, you know, when you know all your neighbors and all your friends live there, it's a little bit hard to just move on to a different apartment unit. Um, but that's not the reason that we do it. Um, but it's, there, there's a lot of different layers to us. Um, I know that we have limited time, so we can't go through all of them, but, uh, there's a lot more to community investment group than your, uh, than your typical sponsor. And, and that's how we, we get the great returns. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, thank you for listening to us. We're excited to tell everyone about our most recent results, but we're always happy to tell our story because we really do think there's a better way of doing it. And um, we think everybody should be doing it this way because it's a great way to make these communities better, make a great amount of wealth in between, make a great amount of money for the investors, but also, yeah, you're just you're just transforming the actual property. So that this means a lot to us. So thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you. I yeah, have a thank you. I have Couple questions. Couple questions. Um, headwinds. You mentioned at the beginning some headwinds. Um, and and let's. Um, I'd like to have you talk a little bit more about the headwinds that you're seeing and and strategies that you're using to uh, to mitigate those or manage them or uh, eliminate them. Yeah, that's a great question to me. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a couple of major things uh, these days is insurance rates. Um, we were able to, because of our, our scale, we were able to mitigate that through umbrella policies, um, which is a, a blanket policy across the portfolios. And that's able to lower our rates a lot. Um, so that's an advantage that you have when you have our scale uh, versus you know a sponsor with one property. Um, you're not able to do an umbrella policy. Um, so that that helps a lot. And then the uh, insurance rates, everyone knows, you know, rates are are high these days. 
um, we think it's uh, it's a major advantage for us uh, to be able to, because the uh, apartments are almost solely based on your net operating income, and then your your cap your cap rate, and your cap rate comes from type of market you're in a bit, but then also the the interest rate. So rates being high makes you know the cap rate high. So you're dividing by you know a bigger number, uh, which makes your value lower. So we're able to buy at a lower price, and we've completed the one because we just hit it out of the park. We were able to refi at a great value even with the high cap rate. But all of these properties that we've purchased, we're transforming as rates start to fall and your cap rates fall. The property just becomes naturally, you know, at the same NOI, um, much, much more valuable. And so that's going to, you know, go from a headwind to a, you know, tailwind pretty soon here where we're driving the NOI up at the same time as cap rates going down. And uh, it's, it's an exciting time. Okay. And then I want to talk about um, both the, uh, investor experience and the tenant experience uh, because you mentioned a couple of things but i think something that's really subtle with you guys that that needs to be brought forward is your let's say the six property you just refinanced what was the hold period on that that one ended up being 22 months so you returned a 20% average but turned it around 22 months, the investors had their money back, right? That's right. And, and, so, and that's 20% average annual return, so 20% a year, so yeah. And so and they, and you have open properties that if an investor wanted to, it's yeah, they take their money, but they can roll it into another investment with you. It's almost like finding an investment that is compounding. Exactly, yeah. We, we actually um, show modeling to all of our investors when they first start investing with us where um, they can, you know, turn their money into, um, you know, 10 times what it is in 10 years because of the compounding, you know, over three or four deals. So, um, you know, we always think everyone's going to reinvest because of the percentage that we're giving out. And we, we're always going to have a deal as well for them to roll over into. I mean, we're, this is the acquisitions team here. We're always working on deals. We're always putting things in the pipeline. So, um, Whenever there is a refi coming, we know um, there's going to be a deal right behind it. Okay. Um, and the other thing is this short cycle has got to be maximizing the depreciation to the investors. Yes. Uh, so we uh, we always do a cost segregation. So in the, in the first year, that's an advantage with multifamily over say a single family home is it's it's worthwhile to do that cost segregation. And so what that what that is is you have a depreciation schedule for every single item that's in a multifamily building, uh, your roofs, your your carpeting, your wiring, everything breaks down to an amount of years before it depreciates down to zero. And so uh, you're able to accelerate that depreciation into year one. So anybody that invested in that six property deal in the first year of your investment, even if that was you know the last day of the year that we bought, uh, you immediately get a, a negative K one, and so that's your that's a tax document like a W two or a ten ninety nine, and it and it claims that you lost a certain amount of money, and so all of this is very not in a gray area it's all just completely above board allowed to to gain 20 percent a year and claim that you lost money at the same time and so a lot of the time uh the for example the cost segregation on this one was i believe it was 80 it was over 80 cents per dollar invested that you got a loss so in order to surpass that, you would have had to have, you know, gained more than 80% um, on that investment. So you're able to claim that you 
made, you know, 30, 30 some percent in 20 months, match that up against K1, um, definitely not giving tax advice, but just things that can be done there to offset gains. Okay. And then um, that that's great. I, I think that gets missed because many of the holds are closer to five years. And because of your short, the, the amount of time you've turned that around, that's actually a really good deal for, for the investors that, that invested in those six properties. But now I want to talk about, okay, you've refinanced those. You've kind of gotten some of the pressure off um, on the, on the investor side, right? You've paid off your investors, you've refinanced. That's got to be taking some pressure off on the, on the rent side for the tenants, which make it. So I want to talk a little bit about how much history do you have? Do you have a higher tenant retention because you're able to, to, to keep the rents in line with what they can afford? I think we talked about this on the Virginia beach uh, yeah. property, the dog. That's right? a good question. Yeah, I think our um, our resident retention rate is very high. And th what we found is that what we do as a value add, the residents, they pay and they stay is it, kind of the terminology that we use here. Um, but we found that the number one thing that residents will pay for is they pay for safety. And we provide that. We come heavy in with cameras, lights, cameras, actions. We, we make these properties worth staying and worth paying. Um, really, but what we're doing is we're keeping these still within the affordable rent range. We're not coming in and turning these day properties and jacking them up to, you know, price that supersedes the market. We're keeping everything affordable in the affordable range, but we're not leaving them behind and saying, okay, well, this is an affordable property. So like some of the things Brett was saying, we're not going to take away those amenities because they're expensive. We're not going to take away these. We're going to continue to add. We're going to make it safe. We're going to offer, we you know, do have all kinds of different programs. We can sometimes move the new renovated rooms. We can do all the different things that we do on our unit turns. We have a very high standard uh, for what our apartments look like and what how our residents can live. Um, we also have an owner operator model, which we've just rolled out, which maybe can be something we can talk about next time because it's very, very unique. Um, but that model really allows for everyone here on the corporate level to know exactly what's going on on every inch, every space, every single activity, every every single thing that can happen to every apartment. It's not as a whole. We've broken it down to individual um, apartments, individual communities with executive team members. All, you're looking at three executive team members that are responsible for each one of these communities and to make sure from the trash not overflowing to a, you know, a domestic dispute, every single thing that can happen in between, the resident experience is extremely high at uh, community investment group apartments. And, and yeah, if that answers your questions, it's they stay. Obviously, your rents are adjusted, but they're in the affordable range. But the value that they're getting for that is not just, hey, it's a new owner, it's a new rent. We're all for that three to five year cycle when it happens. So to your point, it, it you know, that initial value comes in. It's just going to continue to move in that affordable space as, as everything changes. But well, we have the capital, like Dave was saying, it's not we've squeezed everything out. We still have 30% of the value in that property and growing as, as time grows and as things become more expensive. So we always have these things to continue to add to those communities as time goes on. So it doesn't ever get left behind. There's, there's another side to it, too, um, as far as people staying is that um, who you have living in com your community is very important as well. I mean the safety part of it that Chris was talking about is huge. And if people don't feel safe at their own homes, then they're not going to stay. And that's the most important thing. So you're not going to be able to let, keep everyone at the apartment. People are going to leave, but that's not always a bad thing because we are also very strict as far as who we let in the, on the leasing side into our apartments. We do all background checks, credit checks, all that kind of stuff to, check to make sure the people that we have coming in are people that we want to be in our community. Because if they're the ones causing all the problems and it has nothing to do with the amenities or anything that we're doing to this property, then people are going to leave anyway because they just don't have good neighbors. So it, that's the other side to it is that really screening the people that you're letting live in your communities and letting it be a space that can actually be a community and not just some doofuses that come in and are causing problems in your community. So that's another side to it as well. 
So yeah, that's a good point to wrap that up. It's it's we we have the retention rate that we want and the community demands. We're not afraid to have a vacancy drop because the the type of resident that's there that's causing problems or anything like that. So uh, we have very very strong property management, you know, in house property management systems. You know, this is great. One. Awesome. Okay. Any questions uh, from from the listeners? Yeah, that's a refinance. And what are your what are your rates these days? That's a great great question. On the so when we first purchase, uh, because we're doing a lot of unit turns and capex work, um, we always do bridge debt up front, um, which is unique um, as well to do bridge. And so that ranges from. 7% um, as high as in the nines uh, for bridge debt because they're also providing a lot of the time 80% or 100% of the, the capex. And so if you're going to go in and uh, you know spend five to $10 million on capex, um, there's big advantages there to doing bridge. And what it also does is as an investor, um, the less money that we can raise um, the more your investment is is worth. Um, if we have to raise more, it's just diluting everybody's returns. And so if we're able to get all that CapEx dollars from the, the lender, um, we're able to raise, raise less, return more. And so um, that's always the plan. And then we, we refinance into permanent debt, um, which now is um, in the, the upper upper fives on uh, refinance. How much of your own money do you guys put into your deals? Um, we're, we're all all in, um, but it's at least 10%, you know, per deal, uh, depending on when the last thing rolled and went into the previous deal. But, you know, we're always, we're always rolling depending on the timing of, of the deal. In some cases, you know, it's, more than more than half of of the money, but a, a minimum of ten, which is also generally a lender requirement, ten to fifteen percent. Thank you. Yep, Eugene. Thanks for the presentation, guys. Um, got a couple of questions. Uh, first, a little background. My wife from a previous marriage used to work for a developer named McCormick Barron. Uh, their business model was not just to do the community. That I'm in Chicago, but not just to do the low-income community, but they also had to develop outside of the community. And in Chicago, there was a lot of food deserts. So you, you have the low-income community, but without places to shop, places to buy food. So I'm just curious as to what your involvement, because I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about the community, but outside of the community, what's what's your involvement there? Yeah, no, it is, it is great. Um, we have, we have not gone into the grocery stores or, you know, invest in Dollar Tree or Dollar General or you no, know what, what they, 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 they would bring they would bring those people into the community in order to make it work. That's you know, so they were they were spending a lot of money to to the, to to put up an apartments, get people there, but then they collaborate yeah, so, with, with outside organizations. So I'm just curious as to yeah, no, it's a good question, and so we we do that. So we do it a little bit differently. So the areas that we purchase in aren't like Detroit, Chicago, where there's city areas or where you might have food deserts. Um, but what we do have is a community desert in a lot of these areas. So what we do is half of our company, like Dave had touched on, is called Community Connections, and that's our nonprofit. And so what we do in the areas that we locate that we want to purchase and grow our footprint in, we look to make sure that there is a an area that we can put a community center in. And I think Dave can touch a lot on that because his wife helps with that, our chief investment officer helps with that. But what we do is we actually put community centers in the areas uh, that our apartments are. And we also will have a tendency, we've done it multiple times, and that's part of our business structure is to buy uh, neighboring areas around our areas to grow that community footprint. But maybe Dave can tell you a little bit about the community connections yeah. uh, 
that we do in our areas because we build community centers, we bring in all the organizations that are in an area, and we try to empower our communities through something similar to what you're describing. It might be something worth mentioning. Yeah, so that's that's part of the acquisitions process is if it doesn't already have, you know, a large community center at the property, um, then we'll look to purchase um, existing buildings a lot of the time. Uh, we own a former doctor's office that was next to our property because um, some of them don't have a lot of green space. That's a lot of uh, just roads. And so we've we've purchased buildings like that. And we have a we have very large growth role growth goals. And part of that is purchasing 400 uh, community centers um, around the United States. And so we've started to hire on uh, uh, church pastors that actually are full-time employees. And that allows them to be financially comfortable, but continue to do great things they're already doing in the community. And so they, they work at the community centers. Uh, we've partnered with Truist uh, for computer labs. And so they're putting in computer learning centers in our centers. And then we, um, we're a faith-based organization. So we feel like if, um, you know, church can be a seven day, seven days a week. Um, so if someone is in need of that, they can come into the community center. Um, there's things like, you know, haircuts before the kids go back to school, backpacks, um, shoes. We've started to work with uh, different dentists that can come in, come in and do these checks. And it's um, it's modeled after like the uh, Los Angeles Dream Center or the New York uh, Dream Center, um, obviously on a smaller scale than than those main buildings. Um, but that's the idea is that you form a true sense of community and that within the apartment complex, um, you have that resource there. Um, we have a great organization that we work with that does, uh, you know, hand up on learning new uh, new trades. And so it'll take you from example, you know, working at Wendy's and now they've trained you to have your CDL truck driver license. And now you've gone from a, you know, $15 an hour to $35 an hour. And it's just a whole, whole different bracket and, uh, and life at that point. And so lots of different resources in, in there. And we feel like what we've already done, um, it's not a, an idea at this point. Uh, we've done so many different communities and we feel like it'll become a model uh, where cities will come in and, and see it. It's not an idea, it's real. This isn't tax dollars at work. This is private capital. It's sustainable. People can make money, have great money investing in it. And it's something that can go across the country. And we have a saying at Community Investment Group um, that we can change a nation within a generation. And so that's an idea that we are implementing and, and growing. And hopefully people will look at what we've done and see that, you know, you can make great money, you know, taking great care of the resident. And we hope that, you know, they do that as well. And we, we also know that we can't do it all ourselves. And that's the part with all of these organizations that we partner with is, you know, we, you know, essentially buy apartments, you know, that's the, our main thing, but all these other organizations that we work with do so many great things and our community connection side of the business, you know, completely focuses on all of, you know, that side and all the organizations that we can partner with. So each you know, place that we buy a, a new city, our community connections team immediately goes out there and starts looking for organizations that we can work with. And, you know, the goal to buy all these community connection centers, all of those organizations that are around, they're already doing great things. We can empower them with a space that they can bring their team in and help out the community more, you know, just from that building that we can provide. So, which goes really well with our theme of today is if we're doing all these things, how can we sell this property in two years, three years, four years and turn it over to someone? We have no idea what their goals and aspirations are. And so that's why it really fits in our model. And we love the idea of owning these things forever. Last question. The other part of their business model, uh, I will tell you, I didn't invest with them because my wife worked for them. So I didn't invest with them. Okay. But the part of the business model that I liked 
and it's only because I've seen it. When it's a hundred percent low income, it may work at first, but over the, over years, it doesn't work. So their model was not to have it, not to have their apartments be one hundred percent low income. They kind of combined the two. So I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are along those lines. Yeah, and and to that, I would say not all of them are low income. A lot of times, we're just keeping them affordable. Um, and the reason I would say that a lot of times that your low income properties, if you just want to focus on just the low income, don't work is because of the the general way the structure is, is if somebody builds low income live tech communities, they get government grants, they get all this capital up front and everything. And like you said, it's great for the first few years. You have low income people there in a thriving brand new, the toilets flush, the sinks run, all the fresh new paint, all those things deteriorate over time, all the funds run out. They sell it. It continues to get sold. Less funds, less funds. And that is one reason why the it doesn't work forever thought process is because the capital has come in heavy up front and it's run out versus the structure as, as we, how we described it. But to your point, it's a, it's a interesting idea of having a percentage of it be low income. And that is kind of the makeup of most of our communities. It's not all low income where you only have low income or Section 8. That's not our that's not our portfolio. We have 4,000 units. We have a mixture of everything all throughout our portfolio. And most of them are just in the affordable space where we find we can really add a lot of value, but still keep the rents affordable, um, which affordable is sometimes low income. But a lot of times it's also, I mean, the world is insane these days. I mean, low income can be your E1, E2 military people that is low income for what you know the earth is these days, but it's not really low income. But they find themselves, shoot, I don't qualify for a low income apartment but I can't afford all these brand new, everything's brand new. So they end up, where do they live? And so it really is what we try to do is solve, have a solution for all of that, have housing for everybody. It's weird to think that, you know, someone that's an E2 that really struggles to get by can't even qualify to live in a community like ours if it's if it's stapled as low income, like you're saying. So we try to find ourselves across the board. So it is a good point, what you mentioned, because that is what most people find. And hopefully when I explain kind of, shows the difference between the two. Yeah, and to, to expand on on that um, is that, you know, you have police officers, you have teachers, you have firefighters, you know, people like that, that everyone would love to have them in the community. Um, you know, they make too much money, so they can't, you know, they can't live there. And so when it's, um, you know, a NOAA property where it's just natural and doesn't have that restriction um you know we're able to you know well of course if you're the military you know and or service member we're gonna you know let you into the community and so there's a little bit of leeway there but um you know we're not we're not in the market of like the the class a communities we feel like they're they're doing okay already so we like to really stay where we can we can do that permanent uh permanent transformation Thank you. Thank you. Any, yeah, great question. Uh, anybody else? All right. If you will hang on, I'm going to stop the recording.